If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. <laughs> we had a great uh, opportunity. <laughs> you know what I love? So we met the the owners of Chimera uh, in person. I like um, to say Chimera. Chimera. The yeah. other day. You like to say Chimera. Great guys. And they brought with them one of the uh, Chimera. They brought some backup. Frankie was a little scared. I've been talking shit to him. Yeah, Because he, uh, he likes to be a smart mouth all the time with is me. Is he scared, though? I mean, he's trying to fight he a is. I said, listen, boxer. When you come here, bro, I'm going to punch you in your lip. And he shows up mm. with a fucking two-time. Oh, is that why he brought him? Yeah. Well, well, here's the funny thing. So we're all sitting, meeting up for dinner, right? Mm. We all sit down. And they bring uh, Chris Algieri. Those of you who know boxing know exactly who that is. Those of you who don't have no idea. Right. And none of us had any idea. Yeah, so he sits we, down. We were idiots. He sits down and I'm like, I don't know who this guy is. He looks really fit. Don't know who he is. And, and right. they're like, oh, he's one of our brand ambassadors. Talks really intelligently. So. Super smart yeah. guy. Super nice guy. Would never great. guess he's been punched in the head a bunch of right. times. Yeah, exactly. Great, exactly. <laughs> great vibes. And turns out uh, this guy's a fucking he is badass. A savage. Oh he's, my God. He's the former WBO world boxing champion and the iska and wka world kickboxing champion he went the distance with uh manny pacquiao yeah the crazy part was he did that right before pac-man went on to go fight floyd mayweather Mm -hmm. and so he went 12 that's how close he was to getting that floyd mayweather fight man so in this episode we get into of course we're going to talk about mayweather and mcgregor with that going on especially being a guy who was really close to being somebody who got a chance. He deserves this fight. Right, yeah. right. And so you, we get his fight analysis of McGregor and, um, pa- I mean, not Pacquiao, but McGregor and Mayweather. Uh, Mayweather, Mayweather also talks about some of the toughest fighters that he ever fought and what it was like to fight Manny Pacquiao. What a great oh, episode. Yeah. Man. We could articulate like boxing so well. It was fascinating to listen to. Yeah, we talk about fitness and nutrition. Um, and a mindset, too, of, a, of the athlete and yeah. a competitor, I a mean, champion. It, very, very interesting episode. Great guy to talk to. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he'd make a great podcaster one day. In fact, he was actually really good on the mic. Sometimes you get an athlete on the mics and you don't know how it's going to turn out. Well, he's a comment commentator for Bellator so mm-hmm. I told him I was like man that's your calling man yeah, yeah he did a really good job you can check out his Instagram page it's Chris uh, spelled C-H-R-I-S underscore Algieri A-L-G-I-E-R-I um, I, check him out uh, awesome dude you're gonna love this podcast so here we are talking to Chris Algieri also this month we are giving away one of our most valuable um, assets. Uh, probably the most valuable thing that we offer at Mind Pump is our private Mind Pump oh, forum. Oh, it's going up after August too. Yeah, yeah the price is going to be going up later it's on after this month. Up. But the, the private forum is an incredible resource. I mean, we have, uh, I think, like 2,000 people on there, a lot of which are fitness professionals, uh, doctors. Uh, we have uh, you know Dr. Jordan Shallows on there, Dr. Justin Brink, who we talk about. Johanna just got on there. Uh, Johanna, another great uh, trainer that I, I put on. There's also a movement specialist. Um, we have competitors who compete in bodybuilding, who compete in physique and bikini. And then, of course, me, Adam, and Justin are on there every single day. And it's just, I'll tell you what, people ask me all the time where I get the studies that I reference uh, on the show. And I'm going to be honest with you, probably half of the studies that I reference are or ones I discover from the forum. I love yeah. it. I fucking love it. Like these people will Lots post of smart people. Man. Oh, it's great, and I'll get the studies firsthand from people who are actually in the field studying it. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, if you're looking for an incredible, rev- you know, resource for fitness information for people to judge your your workout form or your exercise form, or how to correct imbalances, all that stuff, our forum is extremely valuable. And this month. We're going to give away our forum for free if you enroll in any of our MAPS programs, whether you enroll in an individual program or you enroll in one of our amazing uh, bundles, including our super bundle, which has all of our programs and is about a year's worth of exercise programming. For more information on all of this, or if you just want to enroll because you're a smart person, the place to do it is mindpumpmedia.com. Hard time. (laughs) Pigeon messages. He he defined hard time. (laughs) Oh, yeah. There's nothing like watching the soot 
come down on man's crack. Oh, oh. What? what movie when was you, that? <laughs> Don't I, be a menace while drinking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when you realize you're going to be in and in for multiple days there, did you look and say, I got to find the biggest dude and go pick a fight? Like, isn't that the rule? Isn't that what they say? Yeah, yeah absolutely not. No? <laughs> <laughs> no fucking way. <laughs> so did it crush Everybody your, in there looked like a murderer, ever, bro. Did like, it ever I'm cross your mind, though, that you're supposed to do that? Isn't that what they yeah, say? Yeah, it did cross my mind to do, to do that and then getting stabbed. <laughs> like, like a plastic fork or a knife. <laughs> So, so I feel like if uh, you know, I've never had, I've never done time like you've done time. So I, wow. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like, uh, lying right now. I feel like uh, <laughs> you know that at that moment you have to be thinking in your head so like, gangster. I'm either one, I'm gonna go fuck this dude up, but then you're like you're saying you're you're nervous you're gonna get shanked, so you don't do that. But then the other side of that is that means that I'm could end up being somebody's bitch. Yeah. At one point, right? That has to yeah. go through your head. I took, the, I took the ladder. Yeah. yeah. It's a decision um, that you have to make. It's it's yeah. an honorable one. It's difficult yeah. to find the middle of the pack in, in, in the prison yard. Oh, that could be the worst, right? <laughs> getting your ass whipped and getting raped. That's got to be the worst. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm the it, errand boy. That's yeah. a good point. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. If you make the wrong decision, we'll stuff. you make the wrong decision, you pick the fight, you get beat up, and now you have to be someone's bitch anyway. Dude, and you know what was crazy? The baddest dude in there was Dominican. Oh. And I told him I was Dominican. He's like, yeah, but we're not the same Dominican. Oh, oh, oh he didn't so claim he totally you. totally dissed me. Oh, he didn't wow. claim you? Yeah. Oh, so man, again, back to you saying that he's a shitty storyteller. These are all really good points that should be in the story. Right. 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 That's why right. I see- Did I we feel, start? He's we, still aggregating we had to do data. A, we had to do a second podcast just so I could get some of the fucking rest of the goddamn story here because he tells these, oh yeah, I went to jail for four days. If we days. keep asking him, there'll be more. I got a phone call. That's it. Yeah. You know, cool. Yeah, you, you missed the guy with the bologna sandwich. You missed the phone, the collect calls. <laughs> Come on, man. Those are the best pieces of all this. This one dude told me that I should have thrown the body overboard. He's like, yo, man, no witness, no crime. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, next time. I got this. Totally. I'll remember that. I'll remember that. Uh, they, they say you become a better criminal when you go away. So I guess, I guess that's, you learn all the secrets. That's anecdotal evidence right there. <laughs> now, Chris, when we were uh, podcasting earlier um, and Frankie kept telling his terrible stories, I yeah. didn't get a chance to really dive into... Uh, you and what your your journey from becoming an amateur and then also pivoting from being a kickboxer and then going full boxing that moment where you had to decide that we didn't I started to ask you and we didn't finish it I wanted to know more about what really made you go the boxing direction and you said a little bit about the, your history with uh, your your grew up being a fan and then our fight as well <laughs> yeah because yeah, I know that right, we'll talk decision. about that we're hyping that up but sure. why not why not MMA you know. Um, yeah, so, you know, with MMA, so I, I had, the, you know, I came from kickboxing and I just thought that um, for me to then add more skills and techniques um, wouldn't be the same as me kind of taking away and kind of mastering the two that I've already been working on. So I felt more about mastering my hands rather than adding techniques that I'd be kind of playing catch up catch up on. Do you feel that that's necessary now when you look at MMA? Like, I, I remember watching it when it first started. Remember when it used to be like a boxer versus mm -hmm. a karate guy versus, you know, like you, you had one discipline. Now it seems like you have to be. Well, good. MMA is the discipline now. You right. Know, like that. And, and there are literally MMA gyms. like that, And that's a pretty recent thing. You know, you've got guys that have now been training MMA mm -hmm. for a decade. You know, that wasn't the case, like you were saying early on, when it was the boxer versus the jujitsu specialist. Well, right. some people think it's uh, training in boxing, training in jiu-jitsu training in muay thai but it's not even that it's also learning how to integrate them because boxing for boxing is different than boxing for mma absolutely true. you know grappling for jiu-jitsu is different than grappling for mma it's a, it's a, you have to learn how to integrate them all and yeah but i always love hearing fighters perspective on this because some of them agree and disagree on this point i'm here i want to hear your opinion is should it be in a one house type of deal or like what I get some guys that I know that are pros that talk to me about like it's so much better to go to go to that one discipline and, be, and, and get master it. and master it by one of the greatest masters in that and go over here, find that one, master that versus one gym that's kind of hubbing. You know, maybe they have one coach that's really awesome at hands, but then as far as his ground, the other guy who's the ground game guy, well... You know, he's only got about five years experience where you'd be better off going and, and working outside. What's your thoughts on that? Well, on that, like, it's not realistic to go and go master disciplines because you have such a, a limited amount of time. You know, so if, you, if you're starting in your, your late teens or whatever, and your, your prime of your fight career is going to be during your 20s. You would be spending time mastering all those disciplines in that case. What I suggest and what, what I've always found best is I've trained with a lot of different other trainers. And I took from them what I could, like what served me and my style, and I kind of left behind the things that didn't. Right. So I didn't take on their style entirely. I just took on 
parts of their style that that I saw as serving me and for what my ultimate style would be. Now, mm. we, we talk a lot about uh, paradigm shattering moments uh, for us in our career and the things that we do. Did you have moments like you talk about you had all these different coaches? I'm sure you've had tons of brilliant minds and talented uh, boxers that you fought with. What did you have moments that was like big learning lessons? Like, holy shit, this whole time I've been dipping to the left when he does that. Like, did you can you remember those moments? Like, oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, when <laughs> the thing about you know being at the elite level, um, your mistakes get shown up, shown really quickly. You know, mm. you make a mistake, and you said, if I'm dipping this way, it's like these guys let you know immediately. <laughs> yeah, you know, they're really good at reading things that are going on out there and making adjustments. The best fighters in the world mm. adjust on the fly in seamless manner. At yeah. what level do you start like diving into like your opponent? Like, at what level does that become a huge piece of like studying the opponent? You know, it depends on um, you know at the lower ranks. Like, you're not really sure about the guy. It's gonna be tough to find YouTube videos on a guy who's you know four and seven. You know, but then once you start fighting guys who um, who now have a background, whether it be amateur, could, the guy could be thirteen or fourteen and zero, because you always have those crossroad fights in the beginning where it's you versus another prospect, mm-hmm. and the guy who wins goes on. Do you people, always know when that is? Like, do you know? You, you don't, but you do. You know, like it, it, maybe the fighter might not know, but their management knows, their team knows. You know, but I, but I think fighters who kind of grew up around the sport or maybe watch the sport know those those kind of crossroad opportunities. Oh wow! And they happen like back to back to back to back. And honestly, it's just like you got to win. So I won my world title. I was twenty and zero at the time. Like if I had lost at any point leading up to that, I wouldn't have gotten to the fights that I got. Wouldn't, wouldn't even gotten the fights, let alone. Had a chance. How many times do you think mm. you've had like a, a young kid coming up that is a potential prospect uh, in your career that you've had to fight? Like how many of those? You- I mean, it started as early. My 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 TV, my te- national television debut, I fought this kid, Jose Peralta, who was actually Dominican. Um, and the kid was a monster. And I had literally people reaching out to me being like, yeah, don't fight this kid. I've seen him in the amateurs and he's really got a lot of money behind him. And like, he's, he's really coming up. And I was just like, Dude, it's TV. This is my opportunity for people to see what I do. Oh, how shit. hard that I work. Tell me, walk me through that fight. That must have uh, been a fucking. Was great that a, game. was that a hard one? Yeah. If you guys want to look up a really fun fight to watch, it's Chris Algieri versus Jose Peralta. Uh, it was on NBC Sports. This is shoot 2012 or so. Um, in a 10 round fight, I think CompuBox locked me in at about 1,100 punches. Holy cow, that's what? an active fight! And everybody's like, everybody's like, wow, why, you know, why did you throw so many punches? Like, did you train to do that? I was like, no, the guy was on me like white on rice, and I just the only thing I could do to keep him off me was fucking punch. Yeah. So I just let my hands go nonstop, and it became a war of attrition because in the beginning rounds it was really tick for tack, back and forth. I was boxing smart early, and then he really brought on the heat. He was a big puncher, uh, caught me a couple times, and then I was just like, you know what? I just need to push. I just need to push until uh, he can't. He can't keep up. That's exactly what happened. What does it feel mm. like? The, us, us Dominicans are savages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're just blessed. With Obviously. Yeah. Uh, what What does it feel? I've always thought to myself when I watch these fights. How does it feel the days after the fight? How does your body feel? What's it, What's the healing look like? So I get a lot, that question a lot, and it's really variable. Like there are fights that literally you could fight a twelve round fight, and you're literally like fine, like you're sore from like and you've had harder workouts during camp. Then you could have a fight that was five or six rounds and you're sore for like a week. I had a black eye at the Ruslan Pradnikov fight for three months. That's the one that you told us about earlier? Where yeah, that's, your- that's when I broke my orbital. But like literally, yeah. I, I, even, even after it was completely healed and everything was good, I still had black in my eye well. You know, it was off color. And certain days I'd wake up, be worse than others. You wow. Know, just well up. Yeah, can, mm. I feel uh, I've heard this too a lot. And can you confirm that you can feel like another man's spirit when it's been broken, like in a fight? Oh my God, it's my favorite fucking thing. Wow. <laughs> yes, dude. So when I, the shark eyes come domination, out. Right? Yeah. When, I, when I fought Provodnikov, I said it in one of the pre-fight interviews, which really blew people's mind because I was really unheralded um, at, at that point. And uh, I said, you know, our, our styles are not that different. And everybody scoffed because he was a, a go-forward Terminator style. Siberian Rocky was his nickname. Murderous puncher, knocked everybody out, took everybody's punch and just kind of like won fights through war of attrition and big power. And I was a savvy, smooth boxer who got hit very, very little and had good conditioning. So when I compared our styles, they were like, no, that doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, yeah, but we're both, we fight to break our opponent's will. We just do it in different ways. Ruslan does it by landing hard punches, by taking your best shot to the point where you're like, I can't hurt this guy and he's still coming. And I break your will by being in your face all night and keeping my hands on you and making you miss and making you feel like I can't beat this guy. He's just too good. You know, so having that moment when you kind of break away, it's probably like like a foot race or something where like you get ahead and it's like, now you're in my wake, dude, and Mm. you're going to stay there and you just just turn it on from there. 
What was? Could you give us a story of a fight that you were in where you was just the most difficult test for you? Definitely the uh, the the Pacquiao fight. Mm. He was just he was so. I mean, you went the distance with him, yeah, right? Yeah, we, we went. To, I spent twelve rounds with with, with him um, over in Macau, China, and um, he just was really. It was the I just didn't expect it. He Me- was Mexican supplements. We, <laughs> <laughs> and um, not even that. I mean, yeah, I mean, he was his endurance and his power were great, but it wasn't even that. It was just like he was so hard to prepare for in terms of style. Like I had hired the sparring partner that everybody used for Manny Pacquiao. Like there was this kid, and he's just he's a, he's great. He switches sides. He fights southpaw. He's very awkward. He's very jumpy. He moves around great, and it just it was nothing like the man in the ring. You know, he was just really? it was crazy. The angles that he was able to cut. Um, the punches that he was able to land from such awkward positions, but still generating power. That was the biggest thing. Because you know when you're safe in a ring. Like, I cut in a corner, I'm like, all right, this guy can't hit me hard here. And then Manny does. Is there a moment during the fight where you felt like he earned your respect on that level where you're like, fuck, this dude is that good? Do you, does yeah. that ever cross your mind while you're fighting? Oh, again? yeah. And, and it happens in fights where, where fights that I won. Like, I'm in there, I'm like, all right, this this guy could really fucking scrap. Or this guy's this guy's tricky or scary or dangerous. You know, some guys, they just, some guys, really they, they got their Sunday punch. And they're not really great fighters, but they're really good at setting up that shot. Mm, mm-hmm. And not necessarily that shot knocks you out, but it, it clips you and it hurts you. Oh, wow. And you carry that for a while. Even if you get rocked or stunned or whatever, you carry that punch with you for at least a few rounds. What do you, that, mean, what do you mean by that? When you, when you, what does that feel like? What do you mean? So you, it could be a couple things. It could be one, like literally you got rocked equilibrium wise and it can take a few rounds to so come back. So you just back. feel off? You're just off. So every step is a little bit off. Your feeling is a little weird. You think you're standing still, but your body's is actually oh, swaying or rocking. <laughs> you got off a boat. <laughs> oh, ex- yeah, like you, you lose your you lose your land legs, kind of. And then, but then there are other shots they hit you. Like it could be like your broken orbit. My eye break, you know, and my eye is swelling now. So I'm I'm carrying that into the next couple of rounds, or I break my nose, or, I, or my nose is bleeding. Now my my, my breathing is inhibited. I'm, uh, it's going to change the, the outlook of the fight moving forward. So every punch can can literally change the story. Is mm-hmm. there? I've 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 talked to boxers in the past, friends of mine, and they said that. You you can kind of train yourself to learn how to get punched and mm-hmm. and st- is that is that truth? Yeah, I mean you uh, you see it a lot when guys when they come off of long layoffs and they kind of like get wrung by punches than it used to. Mm-hmm. Those little muscles in your neck and like catching those punches and, and your body's ability to like kind of like tighten up fast when something's coming when you see that punch and you're like mm, you know, and that's a big thing is getting hit with punches that you see versus punches that you don't. It's the ones that you don't. They don't have to be that hard. You know, just your body's not reacting the same. That's way. what. That's what I've. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. what I've heard people say. Is there any truth to? Um, we've talked about this on several episodes. People have asked us questions about old man strength, and mm-hmm. I, re- I. I had a friend who uh, was a boxer, um, older gentleman. You know, he actually was a client of mine in his seventies, and he said the last thing to leave a man is his uh, his, his power. Yeah, is that true? That's true. Yeah, totally. So, so my pro kickboxing debut. I was nineteen years old. Couldn't even shave yet. I fought, I fought <laughs> my pro debut. I fought a guy who was thirty-seven. Oh shit! And so it was. It was based. It was. It was. It it's was like, the youth versus the the experience. It's like fighting your dad, strength, literally. <laughs> <laughs> Young lion versus old lion. Yeah, and it was just like, all right, I'm like, I'm like, I'm not going to be stronger than this guy. And I've, I'd seen him on the circuit before. Like I knew, you know, about him and his style. I knew he was kind of tricky, and he was he was a good puncher. He knocked people out. Um, I was just like, I just got to overwhelm him and just kind of stay on him. And and when he wants to rest, not let him. And that's exactly what happened. I knocked I knocked him out in the third round, but. Um, now, do you get a lot of help to like, I mean, the way you analyze uh, another fighter and how you prepare for a fight, is that all on you? Or do you have a team now, guys, that like help you like, listen, this guy, watch this. I mean, how does that? There's kind of two schools of thought there. Some fighters hate watching tape and they hate watching fights, especially their opponent before as they're getting ready for them. Um, and then and, and in that case, you're going to have your team do the work. And that's, I think that's really important. Tape review is really, really important to watch a guy. Um, I'm not a huge proponent of watching tape. I just want to know kind of maybe a little bit stylistically how they're going to move and whatnot. Um, but then there are guys who watch like tons of tape. And is that because you don't want to overthink it or what's your reason behind that? Why are you I'm like- a rhythm fighter and I think of that if I'm watching a video, I can't guess someone's rhythm based on who they're fighting because your rhythm changes with who you're in the ring with. And I'll f- see, mm. I always feel like I'll figure that out quick in the ring. You know? So you try and find like training partners that somewhat emulate that, though at least, so you can exactly. Get a feel. Yeah. At the very least, like have the right side forward. If you got a southpaw who's fighting with his right hand in front, or you got an orthodox who's fighting with his left in front, but mm-hmm. also like certain certain tells. Like this guy dips to his right. This guy's got a big left hook. So I want a sparring partner who's got a big left hook. If I'm training for a guy, you know, it's funny even at the highest level, a guy like Tito Trinidad who's known for his left hook. You're not going to spar a guy who's a big right hand. You know, doesn't yeah. have a good left hook because yeah. the punches are coming from literally the, op- the opposite angle. So you. Mm. 
you kind of ingrain and program all that. I like watching tape. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. We know what kind of tape you watch. But he has nothing on me, so. <laughs> <laughs> nothing on you. Yeah, what's, what's going on with that? You guys are going to do some. Uh... I'm 100 and no in the streets. So, <laughs> so I, didn't, I didn't realize this, but I got, brought, Says he. I got brought on by Kamara Coffee just so I could fight Frankie. Yeah. So that's that. they were really, wow. they were handpicking. Dude, uh, Manny Pacquiao doesn't have the Don reach, King baby. of Coffee over here, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the <time>. I mean, <laughs> Frankie's good. also the matchmaker for, for Kamara Coffee, yeah. so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> apparently. He won't know what hit him. Yeah. <laughs> are you really going to? YouTube this? Are you going to do this? Yeah, dude. He doesn't stand a chance. Oh, my God, dude. <laughs> uh, did you get insurance or anything before you did this? Did Why you? would I? Uh, okay. Have you seen my frame? <laughs> you going to wear a helmet? I'm, or, fr- I'm freaking 6'5", 250 pounds, yeah. 4% body fat. In your, in your, in your head? Yeah, hey. <laughs> what? In your head? I don't know, man. It's because we're on a podcast. That's you ate. That's why you could do that for video. Is some video? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> dude, I hope you have dental this insurance, picture of man. You. Teeth yeah. are expensive. Oh, uh, yeah. He knows. He definitely knows, yeah. I got a professional mouthpiece man so I put it in mm. by in the streets so training wise to give yourself the type of uh well first off what kind of fitness does one need to be a boxer because sports require uh specific types of fitness i mean you're going to need a yeah. particular type of it i remember when Different i trained attributes. when i trained a lot in brazilian jiu-jitsu uh i had really good stamina or, or decent stamina for jiu-jitsu and i remember i, w- I went uh, i had a friend of mine who was a kickboxer and all he did was hold pads for me. And I remember how fast I got fatigued doing that. And I realized it was it was so different uh, in terms of the type of endurance or type of what kind of fitness do you need for boxing in particular? So that's that's a really interesting question because, you know, the different biomotor abilities that you need, you know, sport to sport. I almost liken boxing to um, like like a soccer midfielder where you've got to be able to constantly move but also have short sprints and explode. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, but also you got to incorporate the upper body movement, um, you know, the upper body strength. So it's one, it's basically a movement where you have to be able to constantly move. So you've got that base endurance, but then also explode sprint and generate power, mm. you know? So it, it encompasses so many different biomotor abilities. It really is tough to train everything at right. once. You really got to. Do and, boxers nowadays still do lots of road work? Like the boxers of the old, you know, old days? Yeah, they do. Um, it's really an antiquated way to train, I think. Um, especially steady state running, which a lot of guys do. They just run five miles a day. You that know, was like, old school, right? That's yeah, what the old it's totally time, old school. Totally old school. And, and, and honestly, it, you still see it now in new school, um, where I think short sprint work is probably probably better. You know, mm. hit training. Um, you know, it's good to have some some over distance training, but I would say once a week, and then you, I would say do what much more sprint work because that's yeah. that would that would equate to so throwing combinations. A smart guy like you, you got to see. I want to know from your perspective what you think is kind of wrong with a lot of the training that you see in dieting and stuff like that. Cause yeah. You, uh, what do you see is most wrong in boxing right now with your training and nutrition? Probably the scariest um, thing that I see in terms of. Um, training and nutrition I mean, is obviously is weight cuts, mm. but I see a lot of guys, and I've been seeing this for years, they cut their water really early because they're afraid of the number on the scale. Mm. Oh, wow, really? Like I see guys literally in sparring sessions who won't drink water in the corner. Right. Yeah, mm. you made a, you, Adam just made a face like that's, yeah, that's ridiculous. Crazy. And it is, it is. But literally that's, you know, we're still in, in this day and age, people are doing that. They're cutting their water a week out from a fight, two weeks yeah. out from a fight because they don't understand human physiology and how body water is held. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's scary because then you got guys getting hit in the head in a dehydrated state, right. you know, mm-hmm. a chance of a brain injury and brain injury doesn't just happen in fights that goes into sparring as well. Right, we, right. we fight when we spar, mm-hmm. you know, we just wear, we wear more gear, but we're still trying to knock each other out. Yeah, you're do still, still getting still do, do they still do the IV like after the, the weigh-ins and all that? Some guys do. Um, you'll find that much more in, in uh, MMA athletes and, um, and you know, that, that level where those guys do like really, really aggressive weight cuts. Mm-hmm. Um, some, some boxers do, um, that's probably less common. Yeah. But. What about resistance training wise, like with weights? How how does that incorporate it with mm-hmm. boxers yeah, at your level? How do you level? periodize like your entire approach with this? Yeah, we spoke about this yeah. earlier, and it's like it's really tough because um, a lot of times, so working with fighters and combat athletes, they, they're they're generally in a catabolic state, right? They're always trying to lose weight. If the scale goes up, I heard on podcast you talking about your scale going down and freaking out. Right? Fighters are the opposite. Scale goes up at any time. If I wake up two pounds heavier, it's like fuck. Mm. I got to do extra work now. I got to you know I got to drink less or eat less and go for an extra run now because I'm two pounds heavier today um, versus other athletes where anabolism is key and you just want to grow and never be depleted. Um, fighter is constantly living that depleted state. So w- with a, a strength coach working with a, with a, a fighter, it's difficult. You might make all these gains during camp 
Mm. And then the last two weeks when they're cutting the weight, just, just throw it out the window. Right. Guys kill themselves to make weight. I've seen great camps, five, six, seven, eight weeks of awesome work. Wow. Get ruined by five days of weight cut. That which yeah. when you saying that makes me think it's probably so much more beneficial than to always kind of hang around pretty close to your your weight where you're going to be yeah. fighting at because when you think about it even if you put all this you're extra effort person, into building well yeah. if you put all this extra work into building 20 pounds of lean mass over the off season you got to cut anyways you put yourself in a, a catabolic state for that long of a period of time everything's going to fall off absolutely and you'll be right back where you were but you didn't have to do all that hard ass work to put that on and put all that stress on your body to get there exactly the other thing that comes to mind too is if you're doing a lot of training at a heavier body weight you may be used to moving at a with a bigger body. You may have different timing. Then you cut all this weight. Does how did, what does that do to a boxer's timing? So that's another mm-hmm. another pitfall that I see with guys is that so say for example, um, I was talking MA earlier, but I used the the weight class like uh, the one seventy years. So you got a guy at one seventy who probably in the off season is like two hundred five. You know, once he starts his camp, he's going to be in like the mid nineties or low nineties, um, and the bulk of his maybe sparring and training is going to be around like 84, 85, 185, mm-hmm. right? So then he cuts down, he makes 170, um, and then he, he's going to refeed back up, and then the guy ends up stepping into the cage at 195 or 200. Right. You're a different guy. Like right. you said, your body's yeah. different. Your body's going to move different. Your, your, your lungs are going to move different. The stresses on your body are going to feel different. Um, your timing's off. Your, your hand position, body position, everything. You're, you have a different body, mm-hmm. and you've done the bulk of your work 10 or 15 pounds lighter um, you're, you're doing yourself a serious disorder. A lot of people don't realize, even five pounds. So he, being he, somebody who messes with his weight a lot, going up and down, competing with shows, I can see a huge difference with a five pound up or down. And you're a big guy. Of, right. And you're a big guy noticing five pounds. Now right. imagine being like my weight, 155 pounds, 160 pounds, and then feeling what the five pounds is like. Right. You know, like, mm. It's a big deal. Yeah. So you've actually helped other fighters with this process of doing it like in a more healthy way. I know yep. we've made some kind of like... Uh, like comparison, like a Mike Dolce of like the M- MMA world. Like, is that something that you could see yourself sort of uh, becoming in the boxing world? Yeah, I think I think um, I could do a lot of good because of my background and experience and my education. Um, I actually got brought on by Daniel Jacobs in his fight versus the Triple G, who was one of who's a guy's a monster. Oh wow! They fought at the Garden. Um, Danny is a guy that I fought on the same card with for for years, um, and his team had reached out and said, "Hey, like you do this nutrition diet stuff, like would you want to come to camp?" So I was actually hired as the in-camp nutritionist. I meal planned everything out, helped him make the weight. But I also, I am an amateur chef. <laughs> I like to cook. So I ended, oh, up, I ended nice. up cooking every meal for him throughout the camp as well. So like, and we found this great synergy. And he was amazed about how much food he was able to eat like throughout the camp, how good he felt, how his recovery was, and how easily he still made weight. Hmm. You know, and it was like, he's like, dude, you're part of the team until I'm done. So what I had to constantly be in his ear the whole time, right? Because he was like paranoid. Yeah, well, his, more with his team. Danny trusted okay. me 100%. He's like, we're good, right, champ? I'm like, yeah, we're good. He's All like, right. okay. But his team is like, uh, you know, Chris, when, when's that weight coming off, huh? He's, he's still a little heavy. I'm like, yeah. we're good. We're good. He's drinking two gallons of water a day. It's not going to be light. It's cool. Yeah, right. he'll, he'll make the weight. What yeah. what uh, what kind of nutrition strategies do you use with uh, an athlete like that in terms of, you know, proteins, fats, carbohydrates, or even just the types of foods that you're feeding them? What are some rules that you try to follow? So um, hydration is, is, is super variable, but, um, you know, I really got to, I, I like to weigh my guys in before they work out and after they work out and see what their what their drift is during that time. Mm-hmm. Also get an idea of how much they drift overnight and get kind of an idea of what kind of sweater they are, what their sweat rate is, what their water loss rate is. You'll find with guys throughout camp that'll change too. As they get leaner and there's less body fat covering their muscle tissue and their muscle tissue is actually their lean tissues is at their highest, they will lose water really fast. Yeah. Mm. So following them during their their camp and seeing how that changed and adjusting their water intake is really important. Um, and when it comes to comes to actual like macronutrient distri- distribution throughout camp, you need carbs. It's a, it's mm-hmm. an explosive sport. There's a there's a there's a major endurance aspect to it. There's a lot of cardio involved in the training itself. So carbs are something that I really will push up until just the last couple of weeks. And then as we get into like what I consider like the, the cut phase or the fight preparatory phase, I'll really put the carbs around the most important performance part of their training, which would be their sparring. Mm. Okay, they can, they can feel a little rough on a technique day. Um, but I want them to feel good on their sparring day. So we'll focus on carving up the night before wow, and immediately even, after. You even manipulate their carbs yeah. based off of what you're doing for training. That's awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, that's uh, being able to cycle their their carb intake so they can kind of lean out some in between. 
Um, the idea really is you got to you got to assess the guy properly. You got to figure out what his body fat is at the beginning of camp, what he weighs at that point, and then assess. All right, how lean can we get you and maintain as much body lean body tissue as possible, and then pull enough water out of you to make to that that weight. What are the carb sources that you tend to pick for your fighters? Um, I keep it pretty pretty simple. Um, I'm big on 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 oats, of course, oatmeal, um, whole grain breads, things like that. Uh, I'm a potato guy, but I have a lot of guys who are pasta guys. Um, potatoes, pastas, um, cereal grains, granolas, um, tons of veggies, a lot of colors. Really big on colors. Mm. And I've recently really got into uh, nitrates and and um, vasodilators to really help with recovery. Um, like beets, beet juice, pomegranate, mm-hmm. pomegranate. There's a lot of really, really cool research on pomegranate juice and pomegranate seed extract and mm-hmm. how it va- vasodilates and, and in a similar fashion to beet juice. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times I was using pomegranate juice as a pre and then beet juice as a post for recovery. The pomegranate juice works faster than beet juice. So you got about a 30 minute window where it has to kind of open everything up. So I want those guys having those nutrients and those carbs in their system so they can go out there and perform at their best. And then right after, throw in the the beet juice. Again, open everything up. Let's get recovery nutrition in. Let's get the carbs and protein right away and get them to kind of recover and then go chill. Yeah, for especially uh, for um, high intensity type endurance type uh, uh, athletes, they've shown that uh, these high nitrate foods have a performance boosting mm-hmm. benefit. It's funny because I'll get messages from people. Hey, should I be having you know beet juice before or, or pomegranate juice before my workouts? I'm like, well, what do your workouts look like? Yeah, yeah. And they'll say like, no, <laughs> you're not on that level. Yeah, you're fine, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah you're Come not going to see anything from drinking. Calm down, so, Zumba. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, what about uh, what about protein intake? Uh, I'm assuming you need an adequate amount of protein for recovery, but too much protein may be counterproductive. What what, do you, what does that look like? Again, that's going to depend on the camp and where we're at in terms of uh, the weight making stage and what, what preparation level we're at. Uh, protein is important. It's kind of one of those things where I try and um, get it in at some point, you know, throughout the day. It doesn't need to be a ton. It's not an efficient fuel source for these guys. Their 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 energy is going to come from their carbs, but from a recovery aspect, it's really important. Mm-hmm. I'll focus it more around their strength training days, um, around their sparring days, where they're really kind of getting getting beat down, and recovery is going to be more important. Now, do you coach uh, and help them with what is widely considered to be one of the most important parts of preparing yourself for competition, the mental aspect? Is that something that you work with people with as well? So that was uh, that was a secondary job that uh, the, the camp, Daniel's camp had, uh, Jacob's camp had brought me on for because I had been to the highest level. I'd seen what this is like. I'd seen what tra- fighters go through during camp. And... Um, Danny really trusted me in, in that regard as well. So we had a lot of personal time to spend and we got to talk about these kinds of things. Um, from One from a technical aspect, but also from that psychological mindset of getting ready for what we're about to do. Um, so that that becomes important. And just hearing someone tell you that like, hey, you know, we're in a good position right now and we're going to make the weight no problem and you're going to feel like a fucking monster on fight night. From someone who's done it is is really satisfying, gratifying, or, or um, gives these guys a sense of calm where they'd be like, "All right, we're doing everything right. I don't have to worry about that." Yeah, in any any competition I've ever been in, um, I have a real easy time training. Leading up to the competition, uh, I learned real quick that um, I would exhaust myself from the stress and anxiety of the upcoming competition and. Uh, in some of the first competitions I did, uh, I would be exhausted, I, and I couldn't believe it. It's like I thought I was more fit than this. It's because I got so tired. How do you? How did you deal with that yourself? Going in, did you have those kind of nerves, and did you figure out strategies to deal with that? Absolutely. So I was a big uh, visual, visualization guy. I spend my camps at least uh, a few minutes, at least a few minutes a day, and sometimes I would do more, especially earlier in my career, kind of spending like an hour or so, really just laying. I shut off the lights. I shut the phone off. Everything. Don't leave. I'm, I'm in my time. Nobody, nobody bother me. Shut everything down. And I will see myself walking into that ring because that's one of the scariest things in the world. Walking down the tunnel when you're walking out and you see 20,000 people. You, don't, you can't even see the people because the lights are like shining on you. Your music is blasting. The music that you chose, which you know it's, now it's war. It's time. Mm-hmm. Everything you've worked for is literally this moment. And you're walking into this tunnel. You're going into the unknown. The ring is highlighted with lights. And like, that's where I'm going. I'm going to meet the man that I've been training to destroy, who's been training to destroy me for months, and this is actually that moment. What an adrenaline rush. Yeah. So yeah. That, a bunch of drunk people screaming your name. Yep. Ah! Yeah. Or, 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 dude, the guy, like or the guy who, dude. or the guy who screams, fuck you, you suck. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. like you you've got to be able to just have tunnel vision like at that point. And um so when I when every time I fought, I've seen that for that night ten thousand times. I've I've walked into that arena. 
I've walked into that ring. I've stepped through the ropes. I pulled my robe off when they said my name. I've touched gloves with this guy. I've looked him in his eyes, looked in his fucking soul. And, and I've been there t- a thousand, ten thousand times before I've ever gotten into the ring because I've spent that time laying in my bed, get, getting horizontal, feet crossed, eyes closed, just staring. I'm not, I'm not napping. I'm not sleeping, but I'm kind of in that in-between state and just really running that on a reel. And I will pick throughout camp at what point I'm going to talk about. I, I think about. I've even done like, all right, I'm in, I'm in the limo on the way to the arena. You know, I'm getting out of the car with my team. The, the cameras are in my face. The taking pictures. They're asking for interviews. You know, I've seen that all before it happens, hmm. and that really just helps with that sense of calmness and being prepared Have, for. Do you feel you like do? you've practiced that so well that you can now like you feel like when you get into that position, you're like, yeah, I've seen all this. Saw all that. I knew I heard that. I seen that. Like, have you gotten better and better at doing that? Like, as you've gotten... I've gotten better at getting into the place where what I'm thinking and doing has has the the, the positive effect I'm looking for. I think when I was younger, I had to maybe run it through a lot more because I needed to kind of calm everything down, block everything out, and just like, all right, maybe like the 150th time. I've All right, now I, now I actually see this clearer. Where now it's like, I can think about it a handful of times. It's like, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm in my flow now mm-hmm. and I'm ready for to... to use this for a positive interaction. Have you, uh, go ahead. Uh, you know, I want to know if you, there are certain things that you do to get into that mode. Like uh, we've talked about on our show before using brain FM or using cannabis or doing things to get me in that mindset. So I Meditation. can get, get into my flow state. Are there practices that you've put in place to do that? Yeah. Um, I, I don't talk much during like camp and getting ready for like, even for that, like I literally, I'm really preparing for that. Like as soon as my training session ends and I just kind of want to, separate myself from interaction uh staying off my phone is big because that's that's a mind suck man that thing will you can get lost especially if you read what people are saying about the fight and what Mm -hmm. they're saying about you yeah um i'm big with like aromatherapy i really love candles i will light things and incenses and things like that just to kind of get me to help relax and um epsom salt baths hot baths kind of just really just get my body to chill which can help my mind come out more i feel like everything else will melt away and then i'm left with what i really need to what i need to train at that point I feel like um, fighting, because it is really, if you really examine all sports, um, they all are extensions of the original competition, which was fighting. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you're fighting for survival or fighting for resources. And so it's the, you know, people have referred to all combat sports as uh, the purest of all sports. Has boxing or kickboxing, fighting, has that uh, set a different perspective for you when you go out into life or? When you do other things, does it change things for you? Cause I got to imagine if you can handle visualization, you know, walking into right. an arena, getting ready the to ultimate fight. Stressful yeah, Manny Pacquiao ever. in yeah. front of all these people, millions of people watching, whatever. Does that change your perspective for, you know, any, like everyday life? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you got if you have an important phone call or a big meeting or you're trying to get something off the ground, you're going to be anxious. You're going to have anxieties. You're going to have, you know, like, all right, what about this? What about that? It's It's taught me to be an opportunist. Where in a ring, an opportunity presents itself, you don't, you react and you take it. And it's the kind of the similar way when I deal with in business or talking to people, it's like an opportunity will present itself because of the way you're talking or what comes in front of you. Or you think of that, that bridge to maybe I need to get this guy to, to understand what I'm trying to do. Finding that bridge and that, that commonality is, is you taking advantage of an opportunity. You, you see the opportunity and you, 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 you go. You know, mm-hmm. you, you take that, that critical distance line and you, you cross it. You know, and I think that's something that I can take from my fight career into the real world. Yeah, I think, um, again, it's just, uh, it, it's got to change your perspective on things. It, it's almost like... Oh, I love that, dude. Yeah, we talk to, um, you know, obstacle course racers, for example, and they'll be like, yeah, man, after doing that race, like, I went into the meeting on Monday and I was like, not a big deal because I just, <laughs> I almost died right now on this particular yep. race or, you know, if you just had a, a fight. I remember even doing that in, in uh, when I would train, you know, just for fun um, in, in jujitsu, I'd walk around and just felt very comfortable walk around because I'd just done some grappling am- fights or whatever. It's amazing how many things that we don't do uh, out of fear because mm-hmm. you know, we're oh, afraid yeah. we're going to fail because, oh, my God, if I do this, I'm going to fail and it's not going to work out. And right away, I feel like so many people uh, get into that game and then, oh, I got to I got to figure it all out before I even think about taking a chance. And I don't know. I've just I, I have the same type of mentality where I, I'll just you know, see an opportunity. I'm going to do it. Learn from it. No matter what, it's an opportunity for growth, whether it succeeds mm. or fails. I mean, I think too many people procrastinate on shit. Do you have any favorite boxers from when you were a kid or anyone that you idolize uh, growing up? Absolutely. I mean, um, my whole fascination and passion with the sport came from 
hearing about the greats of yesteryear. You know, my grandfather telling me about Alexis Arguello, the explosive thin man from Nicaragua. Um, you know, uh, and then I remember guys, even personally, myself watching Mike Tyson, of course, you know, anybody who was alive in the oh, 90s. Yeah. Um, but Oscar De La Hoya was the guy that I oh, was yeah. like, this is the guy. He could get off camera. He could smile. He was a crossover star. Very People loved him. Yeah. And then in the ring, he was a killer. And he was technically super sound, but also had that killer instinct. And he, you know, he brought it, you know? So that was the guy I was like, all right, that, that's the guy. The golden like. boy, man. That's yep. the guy, the crossover star, man. I mean. How would you say your style, if you were to say, you, you, did you emulate anybody's style? So I've been told I've had like a couple different guys in there. Like there were certain aspects of, of me with my jab that were like De La Hoya, but I, I'm a lot more of a level changer. Mm. Um, I've always been told I kind of fight like an East Coast black guy in terms of being <laughs> like rhythmic and I move and change levels yeah. and, you and I'm kind of slick, you yeah. know? My nickname when I was a kid was Smooth when I would, when I would fight. Oh, wow. Smooth, right. you know, I was like literally a teenager. I was like, it's so smooth, look, you're not trying. Yeah. Um, I've been, so one really old guy that people kind of say is Willie Pep who was a guy who was like a defensive wizard and changed levels. Um, there's a, a, a legend that he won a round without throwing a punch. Because he was so, <laughs> so good defensively making guys miss that he made them look terrible and didn't even throw a punch. For one that round. must have pissed that guy off so bad. <laughs> yeah, the, history oh. of, the history of boxing is fascinating. I mean, boxing in its early days was crazy. Like, they didn't stop a fight until you died. You could stand over the guy while he was getting off the ground back then. Oh so in those God. big fights, when you would, you would drop a, a guy, you mess. were allowed to stand over him for him to get up. Oh. Yeah. And the, and they would go on for rounds and rounds. They, and didn't, they didn't have ends. Like 20, there was, they, there was, there was, there was 15 yeah. rounds a lot. They didn't Holy have that. Shit. They had 100 that, rounds. This is, but this is true. There were yeah. actual you know fights like that. Like but bare I, knuckle. I, you know, I love watching some of the greats because I feel like they – were trailblazers for some of the newer styles that you see, like, you know, Muhammad Ali, the way he boxed and danced and moved. You know, he did, he set up a whole generation of, uh, you know, boxing style. And, of course, you know, right now we're watching all this hype with, uh, you know, Conor McGregor and Floyd May Mayweather and all the hype that they do behind it. Muhammad Ali kind of wrote the book on that. Like, before him, nobody really fucking talk shit like that you know no, exactly he, you know the louisville lip like that was his nickname for a reason he was he, he had the gift of gab and he would talk <laughs> these fights up and be able that was where the promotion of these fights really really mm -hmm. came um and but even uh muhammad ali the great was influenced by guys like sugar ray robinson yeah and by joe lewis joe lewis like you said like that transitional style of fighting joe was like nobody else back then he was a good athlete um, he he was a killer puncher. He knocked everybody out. Very technical. Very technical as well. So it was like you had this technical athlete, and it's the first time we've ever really seen mm -hmm. that. And then you got a guy like Sugar Ray Robinson who could punch going forward, punch going backward, had great technique, had a great chin, had an awesome gas tank, could fight everybody in the world, fought five different weight classes. He literally was virtuoso, could mm -hmm. do it all. And then Ali comes in, and that's when we had the first like super athlete. Mm. The way that guy was able to move at 210 pounds. His accuracy was just insane. insane. They say they say he wasn't a hard puncher, but he hit you. He'd hit you so perfectly that yeah. he put you he put you out. Timing is 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 a motherfucker, man. People don't realize the how big of a difference timing makes in your power. Oh, absolutely. You know, absolutely. watching MMA, you know, you watch the Diaz brothers and it looks like they're not hitting that hard, but they're beating sh sh people up because yeah. they're and their they timing and accuracy is so good. They score knockouts and they lump people's faces up, you know, they they're, they're not they're not playing pity pad out there. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I was a big, of course, Rocky Marciano fan because yeah. I'm Italian. Uh, but you know, yeah, he that's obvious. he fought Joe Lewis when Joe Lewis was way past his prime, and he beat Joe Lewis because and he cried afterwards because that was his idol. Yeah, he was a shell of a man at that point. Yeah, and he, he was the money, his taxes. Yeah, absolutely. And then you know, you've got the like uh, George Foreman, another great, great <sighs> oh, I love fighter to watch. Foreman fight. Yeah, yeah, here's a guy who um, I, I probably one of the hardest punchers uh, of all time. Uh, gave uh, Muhammad Ali a, a tough fight. Uh, Frazier, who of course beat mm. Ali a couple times, you put Frazier and Foreman in the ring, and, Fra and Foreman murdered him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, why? What is it about styles that changes the dynamics of a fight? That's what's so great about about these sports. It's like you never. I was like, all right, well, George Foreman completely starched Joe Frazier twice, and then they're fighting Ali, and Ali had triple time wars with with you know they fought three times had wars with Joe Frazier. It's like, all right, well. George, Foreman's going to beat him. George, you know, Foreman's going to crush him. And then they go out there, and Ali wins a war of attrition. Lets him beat on him and, and knocks him out. It's like, that's 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 the storylines in boxing that are incredible when you make when you have that stylistic matchup. Um, you know, everyone said to me after the Pacquiao fight, they were like, what's going to happen with him and Floyd? I'm like, Floyd's going to win easy. 
They're like, you just lost him. How could you say that? I'm like, it's styles. Mm. I think I would give Floyd more trouble than, than Manny will just because of the way their styles match up. It's just one of those things. So you, know? you think you would have done better against Floyd than I you would I think so. I think I think with his um, his high shoulder roll defense, fighting someone long and tall would have always given him trouble. I said Tommy Hearns would beat Floyd up, mm. Mm. where I think Floyd would probably beat Sugar Ray Leonard. You know, he's, he's, he would be able to slow things down enough and kind of pick and go tick for tack. But Tommy, he could hit you from across the ring. He was a six foot one welterweight, <laughs> you know, with, with, with like an 80 inch reach. You Damn. know, that guy can hit you from across the ring. So now, that, this, this stuff, that shoulder roll defense, not going to work. Because no. how, how common is it in with the promoters and the people setting these fights up where they avoid fights that they know stylistically or not? Is that mm-hmm. common? Is it? So when I talk to like people who don't really know the boxing world, I, I, I think of the promoters as almost like record labels and they get artists, mm. the, the talent, um, and they're going to protect their guys. So if they, they uh, their matchmakers are, are the best in the world at eyeing fights and matchups and they'll be like, all right, well, this guy is not going to, ha- or they, t- they test him early and say, all right, he has trouble with these kinds of guys. We're going to kind of avoid those kind of guys at the top level. You know, it's like Manny, you know, has trouble with um, like he had trouble with Juan Manuel Marquez because he's a good counter puncher. So like they end up fighting three times because Manny's a beast and fights everyone. But like their the company didn't really like that fight and they also didn't like the Floyd fight. I'd, I'd heard that oh, because really? of the style. I yeah. feel like there's there's a science behind matching your fighter with the right person to create the right. And you also don't want to create a boring fight either. So it's right. kind of a delicate a delicate that, balance. You've got to you got to test your guy, but he's still got to win. You know, so you want to put him in tough, but like it's still a fight that he's going to come out on top of. And you're right; it, it's an absolute science. And these matchmakers, they're they're basically handicappers, and they mm. can they can see things. They've studied the game so long; they can they can catch little movements and whatnot. That all right, this this is this is going to be the end of this fight, and this is how it's going to go. You, it's crazy. I had a client that was an old boxer. He was in his late seventies. I think I, I talked to him about him earlier, and he broke it all down for me. And we were talking about Mike Tyson, and he said. He said Mike Tyson had such good balance he could knock you out from anywhere, mm-hmm. but he had no balance going backwards. So you just keep pushing him back with a double jab and you throw his balance off, and that's what Buster Douglas did. That's exactly what Douglas did. And when he explained it to me, and then I watched fights later on, I was like, holy shit, like you don't realize the kind of science that goes into at this level of fighting. It's, it's a chess match, insane. right? It's, it's, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's a chess it's, match. It's chess, not checkers, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's boxing. It's, it's called the sweet science for a reason. You said it's science. Um, you know, and, and it's such an old sport and people have been working on this for so long and you have two weapons. Hmm. It's not four or eight. It's two. Now, are there guys in the business that are known for this, like for helping fighters like you, like in that, in the science of it, and like breaking it down like a chessboard? The best, the best trainers in the world, the guys that really analyze. You know, you got you got guys like I mean, God, uh, rest in peace. Um, you know, from uh, the Kronk Jin, Emmanuel Stewart. I think he was one of the best that we've seen in a long time. Um, but then you've got the guys like uh, like even Freddie Roach. You know, who found yeah. who mm-hmm. found. Manny and turned yep. him into an absolute icon yep. um, by matching up their style and the weight. I think the synergy that those two had as a coach and a fighter, um, I don't think without Manny, I don't think Freddie would have been as big as he was or is. And without Freddie, I don't think Manny would have It was just a perfect matchup. It was just a perfect matchup. So uh, looking ahead, what, what are we looking at in the, in the future for you? What are you working on now? I'm looking to get back in the ring as soon as possible. I've stayed in great shape. You know, I needed some time off, um, get, get my body in the right place, you know, in terms of injuries and being healthy. Um, also getting my mind in the right place. Um, I had a, my run was, was fast and furious. You know? and <laughs> yeah. I literally didn't even look back. I was asking, oh, has it been like? I'm like, I haven't even looked back yet. I haven't mm. literally not looked in the rear view this whole time because I've just been going and going and going. I've had time to reflect. Um, so I'm just looking. I'm really excited to get my, my career back going and mm. hope I can get a fight in before the so end of the year. So is this going to be boxing or kickboxing? You uh, mentioned little... Yeah. Uh... So, yeah, I always told myself, I've been saying it. I've had my 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 careers planned out since I was a teenager. Mm. Um, I said I was going to be a world champion in kickboxing. I was going to do it two times. I was going to do two weight classes. I was going to do it in two different organizations, and one of which had to be the ISK, which is the universally recognized world title in kickboxing. So I did that, and then I said I was going to go to boxing. And then I was going to win a world title. I was going to make a million dollars, and I was going to retire. I did all that, but I still want to fight. So <laughs> <laughs> so I still have that, that drive. Yeah, I still got that itch, um, and I still got it. So... Um, but yeah, but I've always said I want to come back and have a kickboxing fight, at least one, yeah, because be um, awesome. those are my roots. I still love the sport. I said it earlier. I didn't leave it because I didn't like it. Um, I left it because of other opportunities, being an opportunist. Um, but um, I think there's still a place for me. Any More. Anyone in particular that you want to fight right now? It's hard that we say that because like the landscape changes so much, um, especially the weight classes that I'm in now, 140. It's really kind of changing pretty drastically. 
Um, but I mean, lay out the landscape for us a little bit. Who's who's who right now in that in that weight class? So and- the, there's the welterweight division, which is 147, which are my last couple fights have been. I'm a world champion at 140, so I'm actually moving back down to the 140s. Um, to go back to kind of, I was undefeated world champion there, and then I moved up for the Paco fight and kind of stayed up there because of certain opportunities and money mm-hmm. fights that were available. Um, now I want to go back and win, a, win another world title, you know, and I think I, I'm, I'm better suited for the 40, the 140, 140s. But 47 is, is funny because you've got these mega fights, the Manny Pacquiao's, the Mayweather's, mm-hmm. um, and but there's so you see a lot of money potential there. Yeah, yeah, and they're like, they're like, they're like they don't even need weight classes. They fight wherever, you know. Like I, when I fought Manny, we fought at one forty four. Like that's not even a weight class, but he's he's that kind of guy that they can tell you where you're going to fight. Floyd's fighting McGregor at fifty four. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. Floyd's not a fifty four pounder; he's a forty seven pounder. But um, you know, those kind of guys, it's all about the money at that point. Like, you can fight anywhere. So like those, the money's usually at the forty sevens. Um, my last opponent, this kid Errol Spence, he's he's a monster. You know, he ended up going and knocking out uh, the pretty tough world champion Kel Brook over in over in England. He's he's there, but I see him moving up. Um, there's a couple other guys in in the 40s that are kind of are transitioning weight classes. Guys grow out of weight classes. Guys get older. Guys chase money, and they'll they'll leave. Um, so a lot of times it can leave gaps and holes. So got to take so, it, unify that stuff. Does it change that fast? I mean, is it? I mean, yeah. six months from now, it could be a whole different. Oh wow! Think about Manny Pacquiao. He just lost to Jeff Horn, who's no one that has ever heard of. You know, and like. Everybody wanted the Pacquiao fight. It's like now it's like, eh, you don't really yeah, want that. Yeah. You know, and that, that just happened. That was an overnight thing. It's like, well, Pacquiao didn't look so good. So. Yesterday, hero, today, zero. Happens very quickly. Yeah. Wow. It's all yeah, about what have you done for me lately? Yeah. You know, oh, shit. Well, I know you got to catch a, a, a flight here, man, yeah, but it was keep it moving. awesome. Awesome having you on the show, yeah. brother. Yeah, Thanks, yeah. guys. Really, really appreciate it. it. Good Excellent. Time. What yeah. about me? You, you I mean, too, you're too, cool Frank. Too, dude. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you too, you handsome, yeah. you handsome you. fellow. You're a tough Thank guy. You guys. Uh, check this out. Go to mindpumpmedia.com. Register yourself for 30 days of coaching for free. Also, if you go to YouTube, you can check out our channel, Mind Pump TV. We post a new video every single day. Lastly, Instagram. Find us there. Mind Pump Media. My page is Mind Pump Sal. Adam is Mind Pump Adam. And Justin is Mind Pump Justin. All right, Mind Pump fans. So there's a few podcasts that we like to listen to regularly. Not very many podcasts, but there's a few in particular. One of them is The Art of Charm. Some of the best uh, interviews and content that I found um, in the podcast world. One episode in particular was pretty damn awesome. I think all of you should listen to it if you're into uh, listening to compelling um, podcasting. This was podcast number 633. Um, Art of Charm interviewed Jack Barsky, who's this KGB spy in America. So he's implanted in America from Soviet Union, but then he ends up that he loves America so much that he switched over to our side. It's a very compelling story. I'm actually here right now with Jordan from The Art of Charm. He's the host. Jordan, what was it like interviewing uh, Jack Barsky? This guy was super cool, man. He's obviously he's pretty old now, but this is a guy who studies in East Germany, grows up there, ends up going to Moscow, can't tell his family or friends what he's doing, leaves his family behind, his wife and kid, comes to America, steals a dead baby's identity, embeds himself at this company, this insurance company, he's working on computer stuff, and then after a while, he just realizes spying for the Soviet Union is just such a waste, so he's like, screw it, I'm staying here, he has, he gets married, has another kid, and eventually, the Soviet Union disintegrates, and he's just like, cool, nobody has any idea what's going on. Well, fast forward a few years later, the FBI catches up with him, and he ends up making friends with the FBI agent, not going to prison, <laughs> helping the FBI with, you know, catching KGB spies, And he just unloads this whole story on this episode of The Art of Charm. It's a two-part episode. He talks about how he recruits spies, how the KGB was recruiting him, what spies need to know, all this human behavior reading stuff. Super, super interesting episode. Two-parter on AOC, which we never do. There's tons of stuff. This guy could talk for days. I swear to God, Jordan, you interview like the coolest people everywhere. That's why I love your podcast so much. Where can people find you guys? Sure. So you're already listening to a podcast. Just search for The Art of Charm in whatever podcast app or just go to theartofcharm.com and you can find all the shows there. Thanks, Jordan. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. 
Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.